Hello everybody again, Frank Mendelcino here. Thank you so far to all the listeners I've had for my podcast. Let me be yeah, frank, be frank. Sure. It's also on Google Play Music. You can also find it on the TuneIn app. And of course, my personal website, www.frankmenelicino.com. So let me get right into the subject I'm going to talk about for my third episode. Another music-focused episode, this time with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductions, inductees this year, due to be announced at any given day from the time that I'm recording this podcast, I wanted to talk about two of the headlining potential inductees, two of the headlining nominees, in particular Pearl Jam and Tupac Shakur. Now, Pearl Jam is the lock of the decade. I mean, if there were odds, Vegas odds for who's going to get in, and I'm sure there are because Vegas pretty much allows anything to be bet on, bet your house on Pearl Jam getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's their first year of eligibility. Of course, to be eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 25 years have to pass between your debut record and your first year of induction. And Pearl Jam's Seminal 10 was released in 1991. It's 2016, 25 years. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. The reason they're a lock, let me tell you why. They were part of the Seattle explosion of the early 90s, the mainstream Seattle explosion. The underground Seattle scene had been brewing and bubbling for many, many years up until the early 90s, and Pearl Jam was one of the bands at the right place, at the right time, to be a part of the revolution that was the Seattle movement. You know, it was ground zero for the world's music in the early 90s, from 90 to about 94. They were one of the big four. Of course, it was them, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. The reason they're a lock, one... Out of those four bands that I just named, who were a huge part of the mainstream Seattle sound, they are the only band to survive and keep going. Now, of course, Nirvana ended prematurely due to the tragic death of Kurt Cobain. Alice in Chains disappeared at the height of their popularity and fame because Lane Staley went into his self-imposed exile and got deeper and deeper into his drug addiction and it eventually killed him prematurely. And Soundgarden, broke up in 1997 after several years of inner band turmoil. So Pearl Jam, by default, was the last band standing in terms of the mainstream Seattle rock bands. And to their credit, because like I said, by default, they were the only one left in terms of fans outside of Seattle. Of course, Seattle's kind of had the huge following, still has a huge music following to this day. So there are a lot of bands that the rest of the country, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily know about outside of the those four bands that I mentioned at the beginning who had the limelight on them during the early 90s. So, of course, out of those big four bands, Pearl Jam, if you were a fan of the Seattle scene, if you were one of those nationwide or worldwide fans who only knew what the mainstream was feeding you, Pearl Jam was the only choice you had left to follow because the other three had become next. But, to their credit... As I was going to say, you cannot take away from them that they persevered through the storm of that hurricane that came through their town when every major record label was trying to go to Seattle and sign any band that sound anything like the big four bands to sell them to the masses. Pearl Jam stuck through, persevered, they handled their fame as best they could, they worked together as a band, they always kept their communication intact. They communicated effectively with one another. They worked together creatively, very smoothly, and they continued to churn out album after album. They continued to tour, even though, of course, they had the Ticketmaster battle in the mid-'90s, which led into the early 2000s when they refused to perform at venues where Ticketmaster was you know, charging all these hidden fees, and they didn't agree with any of those practices course that eventually blew over but the fact of the matter is Pearl Jam lasted the test of time. Pearl Jam still to this day is a staple in rock music and they are pretty much known as the rock band of the 90s and one of the best rock bands ever because of their success and that is one of the reasons they're a lock for the Hall of Fame of course. I mean any rock band who has made as a big as big an impact that Pearl Jam has over the last quarter century worthy of being put into the Hall of Fame. They're also worthy of being put into the Hall of Fame for his ballot inductees because 
The members of that band, two members in particular, Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard, Stone Gossard, the rhythm guitarist, Jeff Ament, the bassist, those two are the epitome of the Seattle scene. Like I said, the Seattle music scene had been going on long before the mainstream caught on to it, all the way from the late 60s, all the way through the late 80s, then of course to the early 90s, super duper, worldwide, mass, mainstream explosion. And Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard were a part of that sound that became known as grunge, which I think is a fucking stupid term. I mean, these guys were all rock musicians. They played rock and roll music. Grunge is a fucking term that the mainstream needed to label the Seattle sound. You gotta package everything, right? You gotta sell it. Well, Stone Gossard and Jeff Ament, they were part of many musicians who were coming up in Seattle in the early 80s, one of which included Duff McKagan, you might know him as the basis of Guns N' Roses, one of the big-time hard rock bands of the mid to late 80s and, of course, early 90s. Part of the Sunset scene in L.A., the Sunset Strip scene, Duff McKagan left Seattle in the mid-80s to go to L.A. because he was one of their best musicians. And at the time, see, nobody knew that Seattle was going to become the focus of the globe. All those musicians figured they just you know, had their own thing going on in Seattle, a local scene. They traveled down the West Coast every once in a while. But for the most part, that was all it was to them. They didn't think that they were going to become ridiculous major rock stars. But Duff McKagan, you see, he wanted that. So he went to L.A. in the mid-'80s. He also wanted to escape the Seattle drug scene. But Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard, they were part of many bands in their early days. And one of those bands included Green River, which is widely considered to be one of the first grunge, quote-unquote, grunge bands. And that featured, obviously, Gossard on guitar, and I meant on bass, and it featured Steve Turner on drums and Mark Arm as their singer. Now, Mark Arm and Steve Turner, when Green River broke up, they would go on to form a band called Mud Honey, one of the seminal acts of Seattle. Seattle was a community built on brotherhood. These guys all came up together, they all played together, open for one another. At some point, they were all in bands with one another, it seems like, if you look into their history and read about them. Really tight-knit scene as opposed to many other music scenes you might read about. That's why I think it's the most fascinating. And it became this, this ground zero for this insane explosion that nobody expected. So Green River, like I said, one of the first grunge bands, breaks up. Mark Arm and Steve Turner form Mud Honey. Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard form a new band called Mother Love Bone, and they recruit Andy Wood to be their lead singer. Now, Andy Wood, he was in a band called Malfunction, which is also one of the early grunge bands. That band eventually came to an end, and Andy Wood joined Mother Love Bone. Jeff A. Ment and Stone Gossard were said to be the ultimate businessmen. They wanted music to be their career. They, they were sick of having the bland day jobs. Music was their thing, and they were hell-bent on making it happen. So they were the guys you wanted to be in a band with because they were about the music, and they were about the business. They were about both, not just one. So they recruit Andy Wood, and Mother Love Bone was a very old-school rock sound. Like they, they, they sounded like Guns N' Roses at some point, but they also sounded like Zeppelin. They were like a combo of all the sounds of yesteryear, which is a, what a lot of the Seattle bands were a combo of all the sounds of yesteryear. It, it was said, you see, because Mother Love Bone got a major record deal with Polygram Records, and it was said that Andy Wood was such a charismatic frontman that before the rest of the big bands came up, Kurt Cobain, the Soundgarden with Chris Cornell, that Andy Wood was going to be the rocker to put Seattle on the map. He was going to be the big star above all the other guys. But he tragically passed away in 1990. A heroin overdose led to his death and complications in the hospital. He was in a he was in a coma, and then he was eventually brain dead because of it. He died because of that, unfortunately, on the verge of their their major label record debut, Apple, coming out. So now Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard, they don't have a band anymore, but they were still hell bent going forward with their musical careers. Now they didn't want to keep Mother Love Bone going, so they have a mutual friend which was Mr. Irons, Jack Irons, the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They had made it known that they were trying to start up a new band. So they recruit a gentleman named Mike McCready as their lead guitarist. He was another Seattle musician. And through Jack Irons, the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, 
he comes to them one day and says, actually, you know what? I got this guy, this singer. He's over in San Diego. I think he might be interested. Why don't you give me your demo and I'll send it his way? Well, that singer turns out to be Eddie Vedder. Gossard and Ament sent him a demo. One of the songs that included was Alive. And Ed Vedder got the music and he wrote lyrics and recorded his lyrics to the music within the 24 hours that he received that demo. And he sent it right back to the guys up in Seattle. When they heard it, they knew, get this guy. Bring this guy up by us. Eddie Vedder comes up. They knew immediately, this is him. This is our singer. So they get him, and now you got an early incarnation of Pearl Jam, one of the biggest rock bands of the next quarter century. But here's the thing. I talked about their impact as a band over all these years and the fact that Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard are pivotal figures, some of the groundbreaking musicians in that whole Seattle scene. So the fact that Nirvana was inducted their first time, their first year of eligibility, and the fact that a band like Green Day, who became, who was like more pop punk, a uh, branch of evolution, they got in on their first time. Pearl Jam should absolutely 150% be in. It's because Jeff Emmett and Stone Gossard absolutely themselves deserve to be in there and get their recognition. And then, of course, Pearl Jam went through many drummers. The drummer they have now is Matt Cameron, who was the drummer of Soundgarden. Another pivotal Seattle band that actually has not been nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet. They should be. Absolutely, they should be. So should Alice in Chains. And the reason I say Soundgarden should be, of course, too, is because, you see, that of the Big Four, of the Seattle Big Four, Soundgarden was the band who started before the rest of the Big Four, and they were the band that all those other guys were aspiring to be. Kurt Cobain once went up to the guitarist of Soundgarden, Kim Thale, if I'm pronouncing that, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> He went up to him, did Cobain, and he said, consider yourselves our biggest influence. Jerry Cantrell also said that I learned a lot from the guys in Soundgarden uh, how to tune my instrument, to tune my guitar to the sound that I was looking for. So Soundgarden was a big influence. They should get their recognition. I'm sure they will eventually. But now let's talk about Eddie Vedder. Because for better or worse, when you talk about a band and their perception, the masses are always going to think of the front man the face of the band. So, in that sense, Pearl Jam is Eddie Vedder. Eddie Vedder is Pearl Jam. Now, when he got to Seattle, because he was an outsider, per se, not from the city or one of the surrounding towns of Seattle like everybody else was, he remarked that he truly did feel out of place, like he didn't belong. He didn't have that brotherhood that everybody else did. So he was very nervous and very shy about becoming the face of this band, being their singer, and if he would even be any good at it. Well, eventually, that was put to rest because when Andy Wood died, Chris Cornell actually created a one-off tribute band called Temple of the Dog. Vetter, of course, would sing vocals with Chris Cornell on the most known track, most famous track off that album, which, of course, is Hunger Strike. Eventually, they performed it in concert together at a concert where both Cornell and his people were there, and Vetter and Pearl Jam were there. Cornell brought Eddie Vetter out on stage, and he introduced him to the crowd. Basically, it was one of those moments of, hey, this guy, he is one of us. So you embrace him with open arms just as you do the rest of us. And that was said to be the moment where Eddie Vetter knew he belonged, truly had become a member of the scene. Now, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I find it interesting that Pearl Jam is obviously nominated already. I knew that was going to happen, but I find it interesting in the sense that, see, they formed in 1990, and by this point, Soundgarden was already a band with five years under their belt and a couple of records done and on the verge of their own stardom. Nirvana was just about to blow up and change the face of music throughout the world, and Alice in Chains had their major label debut, Facelift, already out and released, and they were the first Seattle band to have a gold record, believe that or not. They were the first one to really hit the charts with the big record sales and open it up for the rest of the bands. I read an article that said, actually, Alice in Chains kicked down the door for Seattle, but then Nirvana sprinted right through it. So here's the thing. Pearl Jam forms in 1990. Alice in Chains, you see, Pearl Jam was known as Mookie Blaylock in the beginning, before they were even Pearl Jam. And that was a little inside joke to Mookie Blaylock, the Chicago Bulls player, Eddie Vedder, of course, Illinois native from Evanston, originally eventually moved to San Diego and eventually found his way to Seattle. And Mookie Blaylock was the name of their band. They eventually ran into lawsuit problems with that, and they settled on Pearl Jam. But 
Alice in Chains allowed Pearl Jam to open for them in several of their gigs when Pearl Jam had just formed. So now you think about that for a second, and I truly feel that Eddie Vedder borrowed and was influenced by what he saw in Lane Staley. Why do I say that? Because a lot of people, when they talk about rock music of the last 25 years, you think of the Seattle movement, and then you think of everything after it. Rock music before Seattle and rock music after Seattle. Because everything after Seattle, all the stuff I grew up with from the late 90s and the early 2000s, was basically just a bunch of commercialized rock bands trying to rip off or bite Kurt Cobain's style of singing or, more so, Lane Staley and Eddie Vedder's. You see, but because a band like Alice in Chains disappeared just as fast as they rose, a lot of people aren't familiar with Alice in Chains or Lane Staley, so they don't know his influence or his vocal style. And because Eddie Vedder is the most famous out of all of them, because he's lasted longest out of all of them, he gets the credit for inventing that, like that holy yarl. And not that he doesn't have a unique voice, because Eddie Vedder absolutely has his own unique style. All I'm saying is that I feel in those early days when he was just starting out, I honestly believe he looked at somebody like Lane Staley and said, what this guy's doing is amazing. I should incorporate some of his techniques or some of his style into what I can do. Because really, Lane Staley is the OG of that whole, some people call it yarling that, I mean, go back and listen to the tracks and you can hear the similarities. And that's why I think when everybody's like, oh man, thanks to Eddie Vedder, we've got all these goddamn bastard stepchildren wannabe singers. It's really because of Lane Staley, I think. Not to take anything away from Eddie Vedder. Like I said, he is his own unique persona, his his own unique presence, his own unique voice. But, But everybody borrows from one another in one sense. You know, it's all derivative. You take from the people you love, you 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 incorporate and you emulate the people you love, and then your own uniqueness is blended into that. That being said, let's face it, Pearl Jam is one of the most impactful bands, and mark my goddamn words, they are going to get in. They're a friggin' shoe in. Like I said, bet the house on it. But now, let me get into my man, Tupac Shakur, because he's the wild card here. There's a, always a big hoopla every year about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Because people say, well, it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Only rock bands should be in it. But the fact of the matter is, the people in there, the artists in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the acts in there, it's much more than just rock bands. Now, maybe it should be retitled to the Music Hall of Fame. Because, you know, there's so many different types of music and different genres in there. With somebody like Tupac, you know, because people always say, oh, rap music has no place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And well... It's obviously a much different art form than rock and roll or any type of other, any other type of music. But there's already five rap acts in the Hall of Fame. One of them is N.W.A., who was just inducted last year. Grandmaster Flash, another one. But here's the thing. Here's my thing with Tupac. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, at the end of the day, they want musical acts who have made an impact on the world. Not just musically, but culturally. And let me tell you something. Tupac is one of the most important figures of the last quarter century. Just as much as any of those Seattle bands that I have mentioned and talked about before, Tupac Shakur, when it comes to his art form, rap music, hip-hop, criticize it all you want. People say, oh, it's not music, it's not music, there's no instruments, it's just some guy singing and talking. Well, okay, I understand that. It's different, yes, but you cannot take away from this art form just because it's not what you like or it's, it's different from what you consider music to be. And I understand that the genre, the art form of hip-hop and rap has, in a way, devolved over the years. Its golden age is long gone. Now, there's still great artists out there, but they seem to be few and far between compared to years past. But Tupac Shakur, this guy was essentially... I mean, when you talk about the 90s, I mentioned in my last podcast that Kurt Cobain was the poster boy of the 1990s, but in a way, so was Tupac. The both of them were. They were like the yin and the yang of the 1990s. They both resonated so much with all types of people. And Tupac, in my opinion, there has never been a more powerful, singular force in rap or hip-hop. Now, you might say, oh, well, Tupac wasn't doing anything different 
than some of the pioneers of rap music in the 80s, like Run DMC or Ren WA or Public Enemy. Fuck the system. We're coming up. We're coming after you. But the thing is, I said singular. Public Enemy is obviously a group. NWA was a group. It was a collective number of people, several people together who worked as one. But Pac was all on his own, man. He was a fucking wrecking crew. Tupac was a one-man army. There was nobody like him in that sense before him, and there has been nobody like him after. Tupac was one of a kind, and he came up at the right time. Now, he was born in New York, East Coast kid. He was exposed to the arts very early on. He was in a play when he was a kid, Raisin in the Sun. And then he went to the Baltimore School of the Arts, where he was trained in Shakespeare, poetry, and all sorts of creative expression and art forms. That's, that's the thing about Pac that people don't know, and that some people forget. Yeah, this guy became a rapper. That's what made him famous. But this guy was cultured, man. I would recommend anybody who wants to know more about Tupac or to really see into who he was as an artist and as a man, as a human being. Because let's face it, we always forget that these artists we look up to, these celebrities, were people at the end of the day, above all else, human beings. Watch the documentary Tupac Resurrection. It will open your eyes to the artist that was Tupac Shakur. I mean, this guy's musical influences ranged from Don McLean in the 60s to the rap acts of the 80s, the people who had just preceded him before he came up in the world. He enjoyed Sinatra, and like I said, this guy was a huge Shakespeare fan. He had participated in stage plays. He was an artist, artist, so poetic with his lyrics because his gift was that he could be ultra-sensitive and empathetic but then he could be vindictive and venomous. This guy spit fire. I mean, he was passion to the max. After he graduates from the Baltimore School of the Arts, he moves with his family to California. Now, eventually, he becomes a roadie and a background dancer with a group called Digital Underground. His introduction to the music world and the music business, and he ended up appearing on one of their songs, which was called Same Song. He had a verse on that. And that, that put him on the map as a rapper. And then that led to his debut album, which was Tupacalypse Now, which was a highly charged political album. I mean, he attacked police brutality, government corruption, institutionalized racism, stuff that we're all still talking about today and still resonates today. So he releases Tupacalypse Now, and it became such a problem with the government. Vice President Dan Quayle actually lambasted it. He went out of his way to say there is no place in our country for a record like this. It's a disgrace. He was telling people, buy the records and should just destroy them. They should be pulled off the shelves. So Tupac had quickly made a name for himself. He quickly became an enemy of the system. By the way, isn't that what rock and roll is? People rebelling against the system, using your own fire and your own talents to say, fuck you, I'll do what I want. That's rock and roll, man. So with Tupacalypse Now, one of the songs on that album, Brenda's Got a Baby, just a really poignant prose piece about teenage pregnancy. It's a really sad story and just an an early example of how deep and how aware, how socially aware Pac was, how conscious he was of everything that went on around him. He was the spokesperson of the streets, man. He told it how it was. He did not hesitate. He did not sugarcoat. He told you how it was. Back when I was in high school, my research paper for my junior year English class was a 10-page, my greatest achievement, my greatest academic achievement. It was a research paper about rap music and its sociological effects. And Tupac Shakur was my main example. What I was trying to prove was how rap music can actually serve as an inspiration as opposed to inspiring, degrading behavior. Because rap music is always associated with, you know, bitches and hoes and go out and party and get fucked up and all that. And while a lot of it is revolved around that, somebody like Tupac, I argued that he was about inspiring you to rise above, to go out and achieve, to go out and stand up for yourself. Now, while he certainly had his songs that were of the variety of, you know, party, party, women, 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 he, he, he was both sides of the coin, man. That was the beauty of Tupac. He embodied both vulnerability and ferocity. He could be soft. He could be cruel. That was my thing. I was proving that Pac was a perfect example 
of how he turned our eyes onto his world in the world that he represented. And he did that better, like I said, than anybody, man. So then he releases his next album, which featured the song Keep Your Head Up. That's one of the biggest feminist anthems that rap music has ever yielded. That and Dear Mama, which of course was an ode to his own mother and to all mothers out there, especially the single mothers, because Pac, of course, was raised by a single mother who was a Black Panther, by the way. So that's where all his political activism came from. He was rooted in the movement in his early days. And that's where a lot of his inspiration came from to speak out against the system and to speak out against what he thought was unfair to his community. And again, the thing about Tupac, he's got run-ins with the law. He had a lot of legal troubles. Now, the most harsh, of course, the worst one, was the sodomy and rape accusations in 1994 and the trial that he faced. He stood trial for rape. A woman accused him and two other men that he was with one night of rape in a hotel. The fact of the matter ended up being that she had performed oral sex with him on a dance floor earlier that night. And then they went, or the night before, and they ended up hooking up again and going back to his hotel room. Well, Pac fell asleep. He woke up to her screaming, rape, 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 rape. And then she accused Tupac as being part of it. Well, because he's the famous person, he's obviously going to be the one who the limelight is focused on, and he had to take the blunt of the fall for it. In the end, he got convicted of sexual assault, but he was acquitted of rape or sodomy charges. He was sentenced to one and a half to four and a half years in prison. He was locked up at Clinton Correctional Facility, and his case was pending appeal. And while he was in jail, he released what some consider to be his best album, which was Me Against the World. And to this day, Pac is the only artist in the history of music to have a record debut at number one while he was incarcerated. And I'm sure that's a, a record that no other artist ever wants to beat. So I think Pac's always going to have that one. But Me Against the World is released. Awesome album. Incredible record. Deals with, again, themes of society and the way Pac was viewing them. He was reporting for his community. That's the, that's the album that features the song Dear Mama I've talked about, which is a powerful song to his mother and to anybody who has a mother that they love and they know how hard it is to be a mother in this world that we live in. While he's in prison, while he's in jail, locked up, couldn't afford to post his own bail, which was $1.4 million. Well, a gentleman by the name of Suge Knight shows up. CEO of Death Row Records, West Coast powerhouse record label. And he tells Pac, hey man, I'll bail you out. All you got to do in return, you sign with Death Row. Well, Pac, desperate to get out of jail because who the fuck wants to stay in jail? He absolutely signs. You got it, Suge. That, of course, would be the beginning of the end for Tupac because before he got locked up in 1994, he was in New York at Quad Studios. And this, of course, would be the infamous robbery where Tupac was gunned down in the hotel, shot five times, nearly died, but survived. And he accused Biggie, the notorious B.I.G., and Puff Daddy, who were friends of his from back in the day, and who were also in the recording studio at the same time, he accused them of having some sort of knowledge of the robbery and possibly being involved and not tipping Tupac off. So now he considered them enemies. He was very bitter towards them. Well, Suge Knight, he used that to his advantage. Because while Tupac was locked up, the East Coast, West Coast war was brewing. Now, a lot of it was blown up by the media, like it always is. I talked about Pearl Jam earlier. If you can remember in the early 90s, there was the whole Nirvana versus Pearl Jam thing. They were trying to pit Kurt Cobain and Eddie Vedder against one another. That's what the media does. They always got to look for an angle. And they did the exact same thing with the rap scene of the mid-90s, which succeeded the Seattle scene in becoming the center of the music universe. The East Coast, West Coast war. It really, what it was, was an issue between Tupac and Biggie, a personal issue that suddenly became mainstream because Suge Knight had gone out of his way to call out Puff Daddy and Bad Boy Records, which was based in New York, while Tupac was locked up. Of course, there was the infamous incident at the Source Awards, which Suge Knight went up to the stage and said, Anybody who wants to be a real artist, you come to Death Row Records, basically saying, fuck New York and fuck Puff Daddy and Bad Boy. And that just continued to boil over. Then Snoop Dogg went up later on. He was like, well, what? New York doesn't love California and the West Coast and Dr. Dre and all that? Of course, when Suge Knight 
bails Tupac out. You got you to gotta think of it like this because here, Tupac was a 24, 25-year-old kid. People forget how young this guy was and how much of an impact he made on the world so quickly. An impressionable young kid like that, who, by the way, was desperate to get the fuck out of jail, his mind is going to be easily molded. Well, Suge Knight got right in his ear and said, you know what, man? Fuck these cats from the East Coast. We are going to destroy them. We're going to tear them the fuck apart. And that led to Tupac calling them out in public and in press conferences or in interviews, excuse me. And then, of course, he had one of the most infamous diss tracks ever hit him up, which was one of the most violent diss records ever recorded. Just straight up spit venom at Biggie from the East Coast and Bad Boy for five minutes. Just gutted them. And then, of course, he would take shots whenever he could, Tupac, and, you know, Suge Knight was always over his shoulder being that hulking presence, you know, making sure his troops did the damage. And that's eventually what led Dr. Dre to leaving the label. Dr. Dre couldn't stand it anymore. He didn't want to deal with the drama, so he just fucking left. But not before he helped contribute to Tupac's magnum opus, which, of course, was All Eyes on Me, rap music's first ever double album. Went on to be one of the best-selling rap albums ever, certified diamond people sold over 10 million copies one of two tupac records by the way to be certified diamond tupac's greatest hits released posthumously in 1998 also certified diamond so that right there that's an outstanding achievement for any musician by the way tupac for his uh, career even though he died at 25 has sold over 75 million records worldwide think about that for a second that makes him one of the best-selling artists ever and the guy died at 25 years old. And a lot of his record sales came after he was dead because he was such a workaholic. He went to the studio so much that they had enough material after he died to release six more albums in addition to the six that he released while he was alive. I mean, god damn. You release six albums by the time you're 25 when you're alive. They all sell outstanding numbers. And then even when you're gone, they get six more records out of you that go on to sell pretty good numbers for somebody who's no longer here. Look at some of the people that sold just as many records, not as many records, I should say, but the only people above him are rock bands who have been around for 50-something fucking years who are still going today. A lot of these artists who are above him are people, like I said, who are still active today. Just think about all that he could have done if he still would have been here. And these are all just reasons why he should absolutely be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But he signs with Death Row. And here's the thing, like I said, you should go watch Tupac Resurrection because he talks about his time on Death Row. He was successful, but not happy. But the bottom line is, Suge Knight, he's just a bad human being. And he indirectly got Tupac murdered because Suge Knight had connections to gangs, the Bloods in L.A. And Death Row was basically, essentially, a freaking front for criminal enterprises. I mean, it was set up with drug money. Look into the history of Death Row and how that got set up and how Suge Knight became the CEO of it. And that's why a lot of people ended up leaving. Like I said, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg after Tupac was murdered, wanted to get the hell away. Tupac, he really didn't like Death Row at the end. But the thing is, like I said, Suge Knight brainwashed him. And when you surround yourself with bad people, bad shit's usually going to happen. And that's what unfortunately happened to Tupac. Because his problems, excuse me, Suge Knight's problems became his problems. And that's exactly what happened the night of September 7th, 1996, when Tupac was murdered on the Las Vegas Strip. He got into a fight with a Crip gang member, of course, the rivals of the Bloods, as a result of something that happened with one of Suge Knight's guys. That leads to Suge and his entourage jumping this guy, this crip of which Tupac was a part of, the entourage that beats the hell out of this guy. And then after that, Pac's gunned down on fucking Las Vegas Boulevard at the intersection of Flamingo and Koval. Just tragic. After that, of course, he became a legend, a martyr for rap music. But despite that, like I said, the guy was one of the best to ever do it. In my opinion, he is without question the fucking best rapper ever based on his body of work up until when he died at 25 and everything that came out after it even i mean in this guy here's here a lot of people always like to say the best rapper ever it's either tupac or biggie it isn't biggie man because biggie was a fantastic freestyle rapper and while he was a great storyteller and a great rapper in general 
That's all he was. But Pac was above rap music. He was a friggin' poet, man. The ultimate lyricist. I mean, he had published books of poetry. The Rose That Grew From Concrete? Look that up. Fantastic book of poems. This guy, like I said, had dramatic training. He was familiar with Shakespeare. He had done stage plays. And by the way, he was a powerful stage, excuse me, screen presence. A lot of people forget that Tupac was a great actor. See, nowadays it's cliche for rappers to become actors, and they often fucking suck. And you could watch the films he did. Juice, his debut film, he portrayed the character of Bishop so perfectly. I mean, you watch him, and he's a motherfucking menace because he's so goddamn crazy, the transformation he makes in that film. But of course, he was in Above the Rim, he was in Poetic Justice, good performances. He was in Gridlock with Tim Roth, gang-related with Belushi, both released posthumously after his death, and another one with Mickey Wark Bullet. Interestingly enough, the film Gridlocked, Tim Roth, Tim Roth was told that Tupac was being courted for the role opposite him, and he's like, oh, come on, I don't want to work with the rap. The guy's a rapper, come on. Well, Roth met with Tupac, and Tim Roth said that after that meeting, he fell in love with the guy as an artist. He was like, this guy, he completely won me over. I sat down with him. He knew the character inside and out. He knew how he wanted to approach it. He knew how he needed to approach it. He knew his purpose in the story and how to serve it. And that's coming from Tim Roth. That's high praise, man. And let me talk about why he should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not just because of his musical contributions. The spirit that he embodied. I thought last year when Ice Cube spoke on behalf of NWA, he made a great point that rock and roll isn't about instruments. It is about a spirit and the soul. The spirit to stand up for what you believe in. The spirit to stand up against the system. And the spirit to just create. And Tupac was all of the above to the fucking max. Better than anybody before him. Better than anybody after him. Because really when you think about it, if you're just reducing rock and roll to instruments, that is a disservice to all the musicians who have operated those instruments. I can understand if you say that rap isn't rock and they should have their own section. I get it. But you cannot deny the impact that some of these artists have had on the world, on our world, in their contributions to art. And quite frankly, Tupac embodies everything about the rock and roll spirit. He embodied it while he was alive. He still embodies it in death. And between that and his musical contributions, Pac deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I hope to God that they put him in. Unfortunately, his mother died this past summer, so I wonder if he does get inducted, who's going to actually speak for him and introduce him. That'll be kind of sad. So thank you for letting me be frank about the subject of Tupac Shakur going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Pearl Jam. And Pearl Jam, I talked about them at the beginning. As always, you can subscribe to my podcast via iTunes or Google Play Music or the TuneIn app. And follow my podcast on my personal website, www.frankmenelisino.com. Thank you again for all my listeners. Anybody who is out there listening to me, you know I appreciate you. Thank you very much. A thousand thank yous. Thanks for letting me be frank. And I will be back again in the future. Take it easy.